Hello, welcome to Meta Refresh. I know it's been a long day, uh, but it's been great so far, so no complaints from me at least. Um, I want to thank Hasdeek for putting this together. Just like the last time, just like every last time, they were out to make, trying to make sure things happen today. Uh, I thank them for um, it. Big round of applause for Hasdeek. Oh, my God. This is a small workshop, so the word workshop doesn't come to it. Uh, we'll be talking about the front-end build process. Uh, historically, front-end developers have essentially just written that code and gotten the back-end guys to deploy it to production. And it's, and it's been the back-end guys job to uh, figure out how to include it on their HTML pages. And uh, the back-end guys don't really care that much about the front-end, or at least traditionally they didn't use to. Uh, this is obviously back when JavaScript was a toy language. Of course, things have become a lot more serious now. Giant applications, almost desktop caliber level applications have been being built completely in HTML5 CSS and JavaScript. And a whole bunch of things are happening in HTML5, CSS3. Uh, but now it, it comes up that it's now our responsibility as front end developers to be professional about it and figure out all these details by ourselves. How are we going to serve it to the browser at uh, optimal speed? What the caching requirements are for those? Uh, how are you going to make packages? How are you going to optimize for page load, different page loads? Some pages might want to send your JavaScript from other to like two hundred pages. How do you optimize for things like that? Okay, so, uh, so we get to that. that. That is what this talk is about. It's about the front end build process where it's called the last mile because you have to understand that the code that you write is not the last step on its way to becoming part of the product. You have to package it and possibly document it and test it uh, and get it to a place where it's seamless. Uh, it shouldn't be part of a daily work. It should just be ideally just running in the background and it does it right for you whether you change the file, that sort of thing. Anyway, th that's the idea. The point is that we have to go the last mile in deploying our front end assets. Uh, my name's Pai. My name, actual full name is Sunil Ganesh. I'm writing down this Sunil Ganesh Pai. I think I might be missing a couple of years somewhere. Uh, my friends call me Pai, uh, and I worked at a bunch of places. Isn't, I'm not really proud of having worked at a bunch of places. I'm not master very long. But my point is that I worked with, the, with startups, corporates, the government of India, and I've seen good code, I've seen bad code. I work at Yahoo right now, which has a combination of the best JavaScript in the world and the world. Don't ask me which is mine. <laughs> um, so, I, I, and as it turns out, there are a few things that are common to the front end build process amongst all of these places, at least for the people who care about it, who care enough to give a good product out. Um, let's talk about you. Uh, this is the, the assumption is that currently your front end build process sucks. If it doesn't, kudos, you get you have given much more effort than, than, than about 90% of the front end programmers out there. Uh, but anyway, uh, your boss is probably uh, old school uh, from the early 90s. He believes his entire stack is Java and HTML is a skin on top of it. Or possibly you have one of those bosses who uh, keeps talking about all the great things that his company is going to do for the world but doesn't really care about the product. In any way, the point is that there are, there are a lot of places where quality of your code can suffer and the quality of your deploy as well. Uh, here, there are some, a few common uh, use cases. For example, you are not doing any builds. You are essentially serving straight out of the directory that you are writing it in. You don't understand that. You will see how that's kind of wrong. But the point is that you're serving raw source, comments and all, uh, barely instrumented, and you obviously don't have any test coverage. How many people here write JavaScript human tests? Oh, that's more than the last time I asked. Three people this time. Uh, so, when it boils down to it, JavaScript is now a serious language, and we better have your unit test for it. There are no two ways about it. I'm not going to defend it anymore. If your code doesn't have tests or coverage, then I don't believe that it works. And no matter of clicking on the drop down is going to fix that for me. Uh, you probably have no logs. You now uh, not uh, in the last talk. <coughs> sorry, the talk before that on performance is talking about how there's no real user monitoring. Not a lot of people do it. Not a lot of people know how long it takes for the average person in Australia to see your page for your page to load. Um, and without without this information, this is all very useful data that you should actually incorporate because you can use it to make the product better. And if that's not a good business reason, I don't know what is. So let's let's start at the basic. What is what is a build? Uh, we can learn a lot from the server side. Uh, server side guys, backend guys, when it comes to this. 
basically it consists of a few steps. These are what I believe are important. One is compilation. Compilation essentially means, let's say you're writing C++ and it gets translated to machine code. You're writing copy script and it becomes, uh, you're writing actual JavaScript and it has to become, you know, compressed and minified JavaScript. Uh, you might want to run instrumentation on your code. For example, your JavaScript, you might want to see what the coverage is. For that, you need another big task where you actually run all your JavaScript through some process which instruments the code for you. Uh, there's optimization. This is not just a build process thing, of course. This isn't just about gzipping your files. It's also about thinking thinking about how it's going to get deployed on your HTML page, for example. Have you, have you made sure that all your CSS is on top? Have you made sure that all your scripts are at the bottom? What happens if somebody clicks a button before your JavaScript loads? Uh, so you have to figure out all those details. And ideally, those again should be automated in a bit. Uh, as much as you can. And then a deploy. A deploy is. It could be as simple as moving from your local desktop machine to the server, possibly FTP. Please don't do it by FTP. Uh, you could be using Git to deploy. You could be uploading it to S3, Amazon S3, or somewhere else on the cloud. And then you have to find out what the UR, target URL for that is and use that instead as a reference. In any case, all this, these things, you might want to run test cases all the time. Uh, these things com comprise a build. A single build. When you say I'm trying to build or I'm going to run my continuous integration build, that means you're running one set of tasks which converts your source from what you've been working on to essentially something that's ready to deploy on some target. It might be on development, it might be on production. But that's the best. Uh, somebody came up to me and asked, oh, in the last two weeks I've written about three different custom build systems and it sucks. Uh, I used to tell people that, oh, it's awesome, maybe you should try writing your own build system because you'll learn more about it. Which is true, fair enough, you do it for yourself. But there's a whole lot of work that have gone into packages um, by a lot of people smarter than well, me, at least. And you can use those tools. The idea is then not to build, make your own build system, but to make a build file, a build process that is fine-tuned for your, for your product or for your project or for your company or for your website. Uh, so you take these tools, you choose the ones that you like, the ones that you're comfortable with, mess around with it, and you make a bit file, which will get right out of the giant demo. In any case, uh, there are a whole bunch of turnkey solutions. These are tools which try to do a whole bunch of things for you. My absolute favorite is Jamic. It's a Ruby-based um, package management system. It compresses, it deploys, it tries to make uh, images and data URIs and CSS. It's very, very sexy. Uh, Jamic is cool. Rails has a pipeline also does a whole bunch. A bunch of the same things. If you guys have any Python developers here, uh, so Django might be a common target. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so yeah, uh, Django Compress I've used for a previous project. I think the Django uh, recommended one now is Django Static Files. It seems a little too rudimentary for me. Basically, it's just sending up the same files but with caching and so on put on top of it. Uh, on Node.js, there are a whole bunch. You can go to the Node wiki and uh, check out the list of modules. Uh, one that stands out is Builder. Builder is really nice. It does JavaScript, CSS, uh, packages like things like And Sangam is a shameless plug. I actually wrote that. Um, it's not too bad. Don't use it in production, but it's what I did too. It's not learning about it. Uh, learn from a lot of people. For me, the most enlightening moments about learning about build systems were going to server side build systems. To understand how they break up the tasks into, you know, chewable bits. Well, where a build, they won't describe the entire build in one place. They say, okay, take all the jobs up, take all the Python files and compile them, uh, instrument them, and so on and so forth. But my point is, talk to your source, I guess, for two reasons. One is they have a wealth of knowledge in this in, in this domain that you could learn from. Second is, eventually, they're going to have to <coughs> take your stuff and push it out to the HTML pages, which they'll be serving. So it, it's good to write up in the beginning saying, you know, I'll give you an output for KC file which will have all the aliases for files and things that you want to replace it with. Uh, worship Steve Souders, stevesouders.com. In my description, I said that I'm going to show you numbers about why it's important to have front end stuff, but that's just it. My entire slide would just say stevesouders.com. Go read every article, see all his talks, loads of good stuff there. He's essentially the authority on it. Start profiling your own stuff. Take the last website that you took, open it up in Firefox, and in Firefox open up Firefox, see where all your scripts are loading, see if you can improve anything. Essentially, you practice and you become better at understanding the patterns when it comes to custom projects. Uh, there are a bunch of um, 
tools, of course, Wiselow is the popular one. Uh, there's page three from Google. Then there's speed tracer, which is not so much for loading of assets, but actually for checking out how JavaScript is parsed and executed. To see where is which part of the JS your CPU is fighting up on. It's pretty cool. So uh, we actually spotted a couple of uh, issues with our code. We moved it to web workers. That solved our problem. So uh, speed tracer is pretty good. It uses Pro uh, modified version of Chrome. Moving on. This is one of my slides from my last talk. Own the browser, the browser is yours, you're the front end developer, you should not expect the back end guys to do anything for you. Uh, yeah, and, and in fact, it's downright unprofessional for you to expect them to just be listening to your job. This is what you want to get good at. Um, just like I said in my last talk, your code is your responsibility. If somebody finds that it's broken, and it's because you didn't write a unit test case for it because you were lazy, or because uh, you went, you turned off monitoring on XBN comments for a while and forgot to put it on. None of that is going to work anymore. You own the browser, you own, it is your direct responsibility. All the way until the first file of the HTML is rendered for the backend guys. Those guys are killed. It. You know, Google returns you results in 0 0.019 seconds. Um, we have to make sure that we match the kind of efficiency that the backend guys have and make sure we do our very best to send analysis to the browser as cleanly and as fast as possible. Uh, my point is be responsible for it. A couple of basics. Uh, most build files will construct, will consist of a few common um, operations. Uh, file, read, write, for example, you will read sources and you will write a compile version of it to another file. Directory travels in Search all JS files right under this directory or find anything in this pattern. Take all those files to something like that. The idea of environments. <coughs> this is quite simple. I don't even have to explain this too much. The idea is that your local machine when you're developing, when you're writing on sublime text or text when you're writing your own code. Uh, that is nothing like production environment. Okay? You are obviously running raw code, raw code on the system. So the idea is to understand that your code might be might be deployed on a number of targets. For example, development, which is on the laptop, or uh, staging, which might be internal to the company. So you might not have loaded the assets to the CDN yet. It might still be hosted locally. Uh, production, production is you know all systems go. Make sure you have uh, some monitoring in place. Make sure your zip files are ten percent smaller and so on and so forth. The idea is that you should be able to specify environments as configurations. For example, compress in my development target, I love compress as false, but for production, I love as true. Um, but yeah, in environments. Some tools for uh, build systems. These build systems basically give you um, the ability to make tasks. You know, you can say create a new task called um, link. And in Lint, you will write your own code, which will pull the code from the file and let it as well and so forth. And you can return the results back up to the build system. Um, Rake is popular with the Ruby guys. Jake is becoming popular with the Node guys. In fact, Leaflet, I think, is compressed using uh, Jake. Uh, there's obviously Make, there's Ant, there's Waf for Python guys. <coughs> for what is worth, my demo uses none of these. I use the same Node script just to show you how you can break through it. But this is work that has gone into it. Pick your platform of choice, choose it, and try to write your own uh, Compressors and validators. For JavaScript, I usually use Uglify. Oh, for what it's worth, you guys can take, uh, write down just the names. These are really easy to Google. Feel free to look at them anytime. Anyway, so, so for JavaScript, I use Uglify. Then there's YUI compressor also, and the closure compiler. Closure comp compiler is cool. It actually analyzes your code and removes dead code files. Stuff that you know that you're never going to touch. Um, that's cool. <laughs> uh, for CSS, there's CSS Mint. That's also from essentially it's a fork of YUI com uh, compressors, CSS minimizer. Uh, for images, suppose I want to remove, make sure that every PNG that's deployed doesn't have any of the meta information, support all the useless data. We can use PNG Crush. Image Magic has a huge uti utility library of stuff you can do with images. Am I going too fast? You want me to shut up? Have I said anything wrong? Okay, no. Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> Fair enough. Call me out. Right? You, you can stand up and say you lie. <laughs> anyway, uh, so for validation, I use we use JS Lint. It's the standard of Douglas Crawford. Uh, CSS Lint is this new thing out by uh, I think Rebecca Murphy participated in it. It is really strict and you'll feel really bad. I mean, if JS Lint made you feel bad, CSS Lint is really bad. When it comes to HTML validation, there's a problem, especially when it comes to dynamic applications, because obviously you have a whole bunch of tags and they're not going to be standard HTML. Uh, 
we have tried a couple of strategies, but in the end, HTML validation didn't really matter for us that much, I guess, because we were writing with uh, templating languages. Um, but the idea is <coughs> that your worst case scenario, what you can do is run a local server, serve up whatever the application is, and then keep thinking local host 3000 slash page 1 slash page 2 and make sure it's validated. Um, figure out your own strategy for it. It's something that's kind of fuck me. I'm not exactly sure how to crack the templating engine. Uh, miscellaneous. Stylus Sprite is something that's really new. I think it came out like day before yesterday. It's crazy. You can just mention images and it will generate the sprite for you. If you're writing your CSS with the stylus language, like SAS or less. Uh, I'm sure there will be a port for Lesser and SAS eventually, but it's great. I just tried it out yesterday. Uh, you just mention, mention your own icons and it automatically generates a nice sprite for you. Positioning, all that jazz. Really killer. Uh, Retina.js is used for serving alternate assets on the for the iPhone Retina display screen. It chooses lower resolution if it has a it's a pixel aspect. Pixel ratio is two instead of one because of the IDPI. Um, Stylus lesson SAS. Did any of you guys go for the SAS? Oh no, the SAS talk is next. Wasn't there a Ninja CSS? Where you went for that? What did you give the talk? Oh. <coughs> so these are great. They make your code really maintainable. Uh, CopyScript is the new dialect Python like Ruby like for JavaScript. Check it out. It's very cool. Uh, there is one specific problem with CopyScript that nobody really talks about. If you start writing a project in CopyScript, you have to keep writing in CopyScript. And it becomes kind of a pain. That means your entire team has to learn a new language, even if it's just you who likes it. Uh, but it's beautiful. Uh, I'll give you that. If you can get your team to convert to it, it's gorgeous. <coughs> Enter.js is awesome. It's, you know how npm for node is package management. You can pull packages from everywhere. So Enter.js tries to be that for browsers. You can say Enter add backbone, Enter add entry, and it pulls it from a database and just makes you a script. So you just include Enter.js on your website. <coughs> <coughs> it's pretty cool. It's it's like a lo-fi method of dependency management, but it works. So, uh, for testing, again, um, not going to go into too much detail about this, except for wag my finger and say you better write unit tests for your code. Do I look sufficiently formal? No. Hey, but write unit tests for your code. Get good coverage. It's the kind of thing that keeps your boss happy. Uh, you can use Mocha. Mocha is great. Mocha is by TJ Holloway Chuck, very prolific, 22-year-old. Um, YUI test is awesome, uh, and it has a great little tools ecosystem around it. I'll talk about that in a bit. Uh, JS unit is one of the older ones. Then there's Jasmine from Pivotal Labs. A whole lot of people use that across the world now. Uh, that's pretty cool. Uh, platforms to actually run your unit tests. You, you don't want to be the guy who's like, okay, I'll do the unit test, which means you're going to open every HTML file and run the test. No, it has to be automated. Uh, so some tools for that are Yeti, Jude, JS test driver. Uh, and Selenium, these actually pop up a browser for you and <coughs> run the tests, collect the results, and let you know about it. Uh, Phantom JS and Casper JS is my current favorite way of running unit tests. In the command line, it basically opens up a headless browser, which means it doesn't even open up a window. It's about 1024 px wide, and it's just what you want. It runs all the unit tests for you and just returns the results right there. No browser, no nothing, which means it's great to deploy you know, for CI. So check it out, PhantomJS and CasperJS, very cool. Uh, <coughs> tools for coverage, I know about NodeCov and JS coverage. I haven't really experimented with too many others. <coughs> oh, of course, and there's YUI test coverage, which comes with YUI test. Uh, it basically takes your source files and it puts a whole bunch of lines in it. That's why in which style of code is on that instrumentation. It's a very low file method of it, but that's how they do it in JavaScript. And that way, when you actually run your code, it keeps a track of what our lines have been executed. That's what we mean by coverage. Yes, so, what is coverage? <coughs> so, yeah, so uh, let's say you write a brand new library. Right? Uh, and you, for example, you have a whole bunch of, bunch of if config.x is equal to 1, 2, 3, then do this, otherwise do this. Uh, the basic problem with coverage is that there turns out to be times when you will never hit the ordinary code path, for example. Uh, if you're saying age, if age is less than zero, then you just you know, do a whole bunch of stuff, but age is obviously never less than zero unless you cool. But the idea is that you instrument your code, and once you run your unit test over it, that means you unit tested that section of code which was run. That's coverage. Okay. 
uh, that's called the coverage. Basically means that much of your code was actually tested. So you have a 75% reliability that your code will work. It's not exactly that number. Don't overdo it. That's my point. Don't start writing unit tests just to get 100% coverage. It's, that's the easiest thing to do. You just go through all your standard cases. Um, write for functionality, right? Test for functionality. Say, make sure this, if I set map center as the center of the testing ocean, then it should actually go there. Stuff like that. That way, every bug, feature, fix gets a unit test. How I write code now, just for the past two years or so, <coughs> is once the bug comes in, saying that you know this button doesn't do what's expected, I first write a unit test, which fails obviously. Like if you click on this button, then it should do so and so. And then I actually write a code until the test passes. That's your very TDD uh, cycle. Uh, but yeah, that's that's the basic idea. That once there's a bug, if you write a unit test for it, you can be guaranteed that it's never or if it occurs again, your unit is to break and it will be well chosen by Further avenues for compilation targets, things you might want to do in your build process. Uh, you might want to generate sprites using stylus sprite or pick it up from some other source where you're actually sending cell icons and it's up to you. Uh, this is pretty cool. Jamit actually does this by default. You should check it out. Uh, the, your images can be embedded directly in your HTML or CSS or JavaScript as data URIs. It basically takes the binary screen, uh, encodes it to base 64, and just dumps it there. And your browser, most browsers except for the one browser that you know I'm talking about, <laughs> uh, <laughs> supports it. Um, in IE, you have to use MHTMLs, but there are a couple of bugs around that. But please, please go and investigate this. It's, it's a beautiful way. It's how Apple managed to show images in Gmail. Do you remember there was a period of time when Apple promotional mail showed the images even though show images wasn't picked off? They did it by that. They did it by embedding the entire data you are writing. It's been done a whole bunch of times by much, but it's really cool. I love this. <coughs> you might want to see about making sure your JavaScript is nice and modularized using, I don't know, require or even just separate files. Uh, you can so that way you can make packages. You can say my main page package is I want jQuery, I want underscores, I want backbone, and I want that full animation. You can specify five files, and that's your package. I'll show you a demo of that as well. Uh, asynchronous module definition, common JS, YUI. The, those guys implement module systems where, where instead of saying require xyz.js, you say require module xyz. And somewhere else you mentioned that XYZ, the module XYZ points to five different files, full form five different files, path files, and tells you okay. You basically modularize your code. You get it to a place where it's not just dot JS files anymore. They are living green objects. Uh, the multiple subdomain hack um, was spoken about in the talk, a couple of talks before this. It turns out that browsers have this limit on number of parallel connections that can be done to a browser, uh, to a server at a time. I think it's eight. I'm not sure, I think IE is four or something like that. Uh, but there's a neat little hack around that. If you start serving from multiple subdomains, those are counted as a different thing. So you can actually have eight coming from subdomain one, you know, x dot static dot. Actually, true. 1.1 is Sorry? 1.1 is It's not two. It's But idea is that you should be able to uh, serve assets of separate subdomains or Separate targets. I don't know. You're obviously loading all your jQuery from the Google API side. You can inline your CSS or JavaScript. For example, if it's a home page where nothing is changing, you can remove all your other requests and just inline the CSS and the JavaScript. This is not to say that you should write your CSS or JavaScript in the HTML. You just say that whenever you encounter a script tag that points to this, just pull the script itself and dump it into the thing. You can put that behind a caching layer, and that's basically one request. I mean, obviously, you'll have your Facebook buttons and all that, but that should be fine for them. And obviously, you use CDNs and set your caching on high. I'm not going to talk. Did you need me to talk in detail about caching? Does anyone, would anyone like me to say anything about caching? Oh, OK. Um, so browsers have uh, the ability to cache static resources, like images or dollars. <coughs> and when you're actually sending that asset from the server, for example, logo.png, you can now uh, you can specify days on the header that you send back how it is to be cached. For example, this email will never change, store it forever. Store it for the next 30 years. But this file will never change. Um, you can see this by experimenting with 
say something like uh, Facebook or right? Go to Facebook.com, load the page, and check out your Firebug. Uh, you'll see a whole bunch of them are really big, for example, 400k, I suppose. Uh, but none of it has been loaded, it says loaded from cache. That means it actually has it saved from a previous time and it's loading up. That's caching. So you have to make sure that whenever you upload to your static server, may it be local or wherever else, <coughs> in the cloud or in your own data center, you make sure that you have your static assets tuned to go to the target and stay there for as long as possible. Um, it leads to a couple of problems, uh, which I'll get to in a bit. Client side templating. Uh, do you guys know what templating on the JavaScript side is? It was libraries, oh, uh, handlebars, and embedded JavaScript, and underscore dot templates. Okay, if you have package developers, obviously know about this for ages now. The idea is that you can, template, you can write a template and dump data into it, parse it, and generate HTML or JSON or whatever. And it turns out that we can do this, we can use this templating trick on the front end as well. For example, let's say you have a little Twitter widget. <coughs> and you're writing code yourself. You make a call to Twitter, you're only going to get the data. You still have to construct the HTML. Now the old way of doing it would probably have been, you know, open div tag, then close the code, plus something else, run the for loop, construct the HTML string, and so on and so forth. But now we can use very strong templating languages directly <coughs> in the browser. So you'll say, get, get the Twitter feed. This is the template. If I dump all the data into it and generate the HTML required for to show the feed, that's templating. Uh, so client side templates are awesome, except there are way too many people now including it directly in the, into the HTML. They say, display none, give it an ID of so and so, and just pull the inner HTML of it. Please don't do that. I will show you a much more maintainable way of doing this now. Uh, logging. Again, if you guys have around two talks ago, <coughs> the only way that you're you going to make your product better is if you listen to your customer or at least you try to find out what problems they're having. Now you can go and knock on that door. That's not going to work. Um, what instead you can do is you can actually start tracking the movements of the user on the web page itself. You can, um, for example, there's heatmap.js as a uh, tool. Uh, what it does is it generates a little heat map of where the user has moved his mouse over on the page, where he spent the most time. If we don't have, as front end developers, you have to understand that this is our job again. If we can't be the guys who assume the back end, no, no one else is going to do this. This is truly a front end developer job. If you don't start putting little beacons on the page, you can use the John Boomerang, for example, uh, but any logging service that can log back to the server. If you, if you don't, yeah, you won't get to a place where you know how long it takes for somebody in Australia to load your page. And in Australia, as well, you're getting a bunch of money from you. Fix that problem, you get more money. Otherwise, people start saying something like over the For example. So, start logging all the important stuff and save it to clients and database. Continuous integration. Does anyone do any CI on their code back in the front end? Huh? Right. So, you guys know what's called Jenkins? Hudson, Jenkins. That's all right. Uh, continuous integration. Oh, source control. Yeah, that's great. Oh, <laughs> the idea is that every time you make a commit, it does an entire sanity check to make sure that everything is okay. That's the basic theory. It could happen on commit or it could happen on file or whatever it is. But the general idea is that there are four people on the team. Every time one person makes a commit, there will be a machine sitting by the side which runs through all your units in the test. Make sure nothing is broken and let you know if it is. It sends an email and your manager gets very worried. But yeah, continuous integration. You should really look at uh, Again, this, there is absolutely no reason that front end developers can't make use of this. Now that we can run unit tests directly in the command line without having to pop open a browser. Demo time. Can someone tell me how much? What the time is? So, I wrote a small build system. What did I write the build system for? I downloaded the Metal Express website, uh, noticed a couple of things that I think they might be doing wrong, and implemented my custom build system on top of it. A uh, few of the tools that I used, I'm not sure if the, if the camera is going to get this, but I'll say for file traversal, I used three tools. One is Blob. It lets you say something like um, XYZ slash star star slash star dot JS, and it returns you a list of files. It's quite cool. That's all it does, and it's quite nice at that. Async, async because I was writing a node and it's callback and then when you're writing with JavaScript, 
I use async to use promises and it helped out. I'll show you the code as well. Uh, I use wrench for um, directory traversal or creation. For example, if you want to make a directory a slash b slash c, you don't want to really try to do it. Just first make a, then make a slash b slash c. Um, this give, wrench gives a bunch of utilities that makes it easy. For command line, I used commander. I could have used j or ray or uh, not ray, but j. Uh, but I decided I wanted to get a little more closer to the menu. Commander is something that helps you create a menu list of options for the input. For example, you will type something like project dash dash uh, pin. So it will do a pin. You say dash dash pin and production. Do a production pin. So I use that for that. I'm using JS lint and CSS lint for linting. For compressing, I'm using Uglify and Node CSS compressor, which is basically CSS men. Uh, I'm doing some small micro templating. I'll show you the code for that so that you can. I, I write basic HTML files and those get com compiled into JavaScript. It's quite cool. Uh, for testing, I'm using YUI test, Grover, and PhantomJS. Except that because the internet's not cooperating with me, I might not be able to give you a proper demo for that, but I'll try. Uh, I also use child process.exec. This is for utilities that aren't. <coughs> for example, JSLint is an executable, it's not a node package that you can include. So I use very regular child process exec. It lets you execute commands and you get the return code and it's the PDF, the PDF, all that uh, let's templates, views, and static. Static is actually where they have all the static assets. Uh, CSS, IMG, JS, I made a folder called templates. I'll show you that code, but in any case, what I want to show you is I made this little folder frontend, which consists of all my, <coughs> consists of all my build system stuff. So, I wonder if I can make this bigger. Is that a little better? Okay. Uh, so I have this script right here, and let's see what it lets me do. Let me do a bunch of things. I can. The first two are very regular. First one, this output. The second one, so the version number. That's fine. Uh, you can set an environment for this build system. I'm assuming I've spoken it over with the Hasgeek guys, and we have a development, staging, and production environment with different conflicts, which I'll show you. So I can set that environment whenever I'm running this thing. Uh, clean cleans the entire. A uh, build folder, very useful when you're doing a fresh build, you want to wipe it out and start a fresh. Or for example, you don't want to commit build files to SVN or Git or whatever. Uh, S actually runs a little development server for me. The idea is that this isn't just for packaging assets. Uh, I should be able to work on my code without having to run the network refresh site, the entire site. I just want to work on my JavaScript, make sure it's working, run a few unit tests on it and so on. So I can run a little local server for it. Dash B does a regular build. Assets takes a few bunch of specified assets. For example, you can mention images and so on and so forth. Push it to a target directory. Uh, lint runs JS lint and CSS lint. Uh, watch does a fresh build every time a source file changes. So that means you don't have to stop it and do a restart on the server. It could be any code, it just starts it. So it does a fresh build of all your JavaScript. So let's take this for a spin. Let's 
let's say clean. Okay, so my target directory is out. Anyway, so let me walk you through this quickly. Like I said, the static the static directory is here. This is what I'm considering my source div. Source directory. All the stuff that I'm going to package and so on, I'm going to put here. And I could have put it somewhere else, but my build directory is going to be here. It's going to generate a directory called build and put all the stuff over there. Let's try doing a regular build. I have logging all over the place. You can, you can see the stuff that it actually does. It sets the environment to development, that's the default. You can set it as production by passing in a parameter. Uh, it does a clean, deletes the directory if it's already there. Uh, takes all the my, my templated HTML files, converts it to JavaScript templates, and generates a file templates.js. I'll show you. Uh, it takes my packages. I'm using this concept of, well, just specifically for this. I I have two types of packages. I have either JS or CSS. I use that to know whether I should use Uglify or CSS Min or so on. But I specify that I want all the starter JS files just at this root folder. <coughs> For CSS, I'm going to take these four files and compress it and make one. It's going to be called styles.css. Uh, I also have specified my assets here. So all the JPG files, all the PNG files, and then I realized that I hadn't put the leaflet map files over here. So I put the uh, this is. Well, a little map that shows you Dharmaram College. Uh, so I've taken those files as well and put it to assets. You can have a look at the build directory. And you can see, yes, scoops.js has been generated. This is concatenator and all that jazz. Your CSS has come. A little more interesting though is what happens if I say environment production? It does another build. Let's go back to the code. I'm pushing my production stuff into a separate directory. I call it build prod. You can do whatever you want. Um, first of all, notice that the scripts that are generated are now hashified. If you can see the file name there, this is essentially to prevent cache poisoning. Um, the idea is that suppose somebody has picked up scripts.js from you already and you want to push him a new one, but you already have this heavy caching on it. This is a good way to ensure that you have individual file names every time you do a separate build or so on and so forth. Um, which is fine. All you have to do is say, uh, let me show you how I've actually integrated it. Oh, yeah. So the idea is that you have to give hooks to the backend guys or to yourself, frankly, if you're writing HTML. So I'm using a little templating here, and I'm just saying pick out CSS.styles. I'm passing a CSS object which has all those packages, and I can say I can choose to load an asset also here. So I'm loading the leaflet CSS that way. I just say assets. <coughs> Go down, you'll see uh, JavaScript also in the same way. I say js.scripts. Scripts was the name of my package, and suppose I actually run a little server to render that page. the rule of these things, you always grow up right in the middle. Anyway, the idea that it would render those special files that were that were generated, even with the funky file names. Uh, point to note here, so that means that it doesn't even have to be a specific file name that you have to remember. It doesn't have to be scripts.js or scripts.js question mark some hash cache that you cache cluster that you're going to put at the end of it. You can, all you have to do is maintain an output file where you, where you specify the stuff that you've created, what it's going to look like. So my, these are all the assets that I deployed, these are all the packages I deployed. Uh, I'll go to the templating bit. Uh, it's, 
This complex.js file has been rendered automatically. Um, it's been rendered off of this. This is a very simple, stupid, completing thing. Basically, output the result of x5 plus d. Uh, you would obviously want something a little more complicated. For example, take 10 Flickr entries or Twitter entries and output the data in some specific output format. Uh, Ideas, it, it pushes it here and dollar dot underscore underscore template whatever is something I've defined here, which basically takes that string and is able to give you a compile template. If you use underscore dot template, you know what I'm talking about, but feel free to research the hell out of this. Like that templates are cool, especially if you have a neat way of getting them into your flow. So now all I have to say is all I have to say is jst.xyz and I have that template available. And then I just pass my parameters to it and get HTML automatically. Still not touching the HTML. Uh, okay, so you can run a server. You can also run a little watch. Watch is where it's ideally it's supposed to change every time a file gets built, but just for a demo purpose, I'm doing it every three seconds. So every three seconds. The point is that you'll set watch and leave it on in the background and continue work, working with whatever you're doing. So your output HTML can actually keep pulling into built assets. Perhaps your Python guys are reading your assets.json or packages.json and using that to render it over there. But the idea is that you don't have to do a build every time you do a change. <coughs> this is a lot better than, for example, a whole bunch of server side guys. They have to do a fresh compiler every time they have C code running on the server. It's more couple of other things. Uh, you can also link the files. I've made it incredibly uh, liberal. Uh, I've made it incredibly liberal, but it seems like there's a whole bunch of things. Anyway, this is the idea. You have a build system now that generates a whole bunch of assets. You could probably make a new task where it uh, uploads it to S3, so on and so forth. And just quickly, just for reference, I'd like to show you that this is what it looks like. I have a whole bunch of commands defined and those are my questions. Go to my questions slide. I wanted to talk about why you have but questions? Yeah, please. Sorry? You're talking about hash Right, right, right. So what happens when you put it into the file? No, 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 that's the idea. If you give a unique file file name. For example, scripts dot some hash dot .js. Yes. Then it's going to be a separate file and it comes in as a separate request. It will never touch the cache. Cache is for a totally different file. Scripts got some other hash dot .js. So you won't have to worry about cache or anything like that. It'll expire as it expires. Yes. Be sure to thank the Hasbeek guys on your way out. Uh, hope you had a great time. Uh,